Sorry, I'm, mum I'm making a mess on my recording. I keep pressing it. So yes, we're actually looking at the uh, writing section. We're doing identifying different styles of writing and the writer's voice today. So we've got a few slides that we'll be going through, and then there's a, a normal standard. I've got the homework at the end, which we'll work through together. So the aims and outcomes of today's session are that you should be able to identify different writing styles. You should be able to identify the differences in different levels of seriousness. So you can look at uh, how serious it is, how formal it is. Is it a journalistic style? So these should be um, identifiable for you. We looked at different tones and text. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, Clifford? I'm fine. Brilliant. We've just made a start, Clifford. We're just going through the first slide. So just to let you know, we're doing identifying different styles of writing today. So within this, you should be able to identify different tones in your text and also be able to know what is an opposite tone. So we'll do a small activity later on within these slides and we'll uh, know what opposite tones are something like what's a fun tone, a serious tone. They're opposite from each other, aren't they? And then we should be able to understand um, what the writer's voice is, and we'll go through all of these today. Get my tools up, there you go. So style and tone, so when you actually go for your reading exam, you're going to be using some of these techniques that you're learning today within your reading. So you'll be asked to identify and discuss the tone and style of different texts. So you'll need to have a good knowledge of and, and a good understanding of the text themselves. So we've done a load of uh, previous tasks. We've done lots of homework. We've done lots of activities together. So unlike those tasks there, you're actually going to need to identify the formal and informal aspects. So with this part, you're actually looking at more of a specific area with the homework and the activities that we've done previously, you just look at a generalized view. What is this about? What is the what is the author talking about? What's the topic of this? Is it an email? Is it a letter? Those types of things. But with this, this section, you'll be asked more specific questions. And the slides that the lesson that we go over today will help you identify those. So style, so as we know, every text has a style. Now, this style will actually be uh, determined by who the audience is or what the actual purpose of the text is. So in a way, it gets adapted depending on who is going to be reading it or who is going to be seeing this text. So there's lots of uh, styles. So you have factual, you've got academic, official, instructional, journalistic, and fictional. Now we're going to go through each of these and we'll let you know uh, exactly what each one means. So you've got factual texts. Now, a factual writing, you can actually see this in lots of places. It's just a play. Uh, factual is just a piece of text that is telling you facts, real news. So it's not fake, it's just uh, the giving you so you can find factual texts are things like newspapers, magazines, books, internet, and this can be done in a lot of different styles. So you can have it in a formal style where it uses long and complex sentences. It might have statistics and evidence to back up the information. It will be very organized and it will have a very clear layout so that you can actually find the information. Now, what I found with factual writing is they like to use subheadings within this quite a lot. So you, the information is broken up and you know exactly which section to look in for uh, the information you're trying to find out. It could have footnotes. Now, we've talked about these footnotes are just those little bits of information at the bottom of the document. Could have quotations and it could also uh, reference some uh, images or charts or graphs. It might use, again, diagrams and charts if you've got something that you're talking about, complex data, like statistics of some sort. It will introduce its subject. So it will talk about what the subject is, and then it will give you a balanced argument. So it will give you the pros, it will give you the cons, 
So what is good about it, what is bad about it, and then it'll summarize it and they'll put a conclusion. So factual text will follow this style. Then we have academic text. And remember, if you've got any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Now, an academic text is quite similar to the ones that you see for factual. But to be honest, they're a little bit more boring, they're a little bit more precise, and they're very detailed. So they don't have omissions. So omissions are where information is taken out on purpose to suit the audience, to do what they're trying to say. So academic texts will have no omissions, no information will be taken out. It will have no errors, and it will have a lot of detail. It will be clear, logical, and like I said, it probably is going to be a bit more boring. You're not going to have any fun information in it. It's not there to entertain you. It's there to educate you. So just think the difference between reading a magazine and reading a, a book, say, if you're doing healthcare or business or IT. So there's going to be a big difference between those two uh, texts. So academic writing can also give you different sources on the subject. So they might give you quotations, they might give you charts and graphs, anything that will support and balance their information. And it can have very technical and specific vocabulary, like um, industry-related uh, terminology and so on with that. Then you have official texts. So an official text is just like a letter. So if you get a council tax letter or a bill through the post, a business proposal, uh, a press release, and many daily letters and things that you got. If you're on uh, tax credits, any of those letters, they'll be official as well. So they have formal language. It's polite. It's extremely polite. They don't want to be rude. They're very specific and it has a lot of technical elements. It tells you exactly how to get in touch with them if there's an issue. It gives you your details if it's a bill, where you can pay, what amount you need to pay, what your gas and electric usage is. So you'll know they'll have a lot of technical uh, terms and elements within there. It's very detailed, especially if you've got a legal do document. That's going to be even more detailed. It's got possible archaic language. Now, does anybody know what archaic means? Archaic, I think it's an old language like we don't yes. use it anymore. Well done, Latin, yes, that's right. Like it's the Latin, for example. Yes, 100%. It, it, it is, it's just old language. It's uh, old terms, old language, and so on. Within that, well done. And then it will have neutral and impersonal language as well. So it's not really going to be emotive. It's not going to be there to entice you or make you happy or sad. It's basic, on the line, neutral, impersonal, just giving you the information and that's it. And then you've got instructional texts. Now, these are texts like well, that will be in manuals. If you've ever used Wikipedia, that was, uh, it's instructional text as well. It's got basic, it's got all the detailed information. It just tells you what is what. So if you got uh, go to Argos now and you go and uh, pick up a stool and it'll tell you how to put a, a stool together. I picked up a, uh, I went and bought a desk chair a couple of weeks ago and I had a very big instruction manual there going step by step breaking everything down, how to put this together, what to do, how many screws I've got. So we've seen some instruction manuals uh, styles already. So it has instructional languages. So it tells you what to do. Exactly screw this in, tighten this, hand tighten, screw tighten, and so on. It's got technical vocabulary. So it'll tell you to use the forehead and Phillips driver, screwdriver, or it'll tell you to use an axle or an Allen key. It has textual uh, features like illustrations or diagrams, which will tell you exactly what part goes into what part, how to join things together. And then it might have bullet points on the side as well, just listing what sort of equipment or what sort of items are included within that. It have, uh, might have advisory language, things like could, should, might. And then it will definitely have precise language because it will be telling you exactly what you need to do. 
So this is what an instructional text will be looking like. Then we're going to journalistic texts. Now, these journalistic texts in themselves, they can differ. So you would have seen different styles of writing depending on what you're actually looking at. So there'll be different types of writing in a gossip magazine compared to a magazine that might do reviews. Within uh, newspapers as well, you might get some really like tabloid newspapers where they're giving you all the information about how uh, these restrictions might be lifted for COVID on uh, July 19th and be all serious and um, correct. And then there might be more of a, a fun piece that's making a little bit of joke of the indecisiveness. So there's different types of journalistic text as well. So we're going to look at two of these. So you've got serious or broadsheet journalism. This is the more of the serious side. So they take a logical approach to the subject. They have a very serious subject matter, so they won't make any fun of anything. They won't be sarcastic. Their opinions that are made by the writers are quite thoughtful and they're balanced, so they might, they're not going to be biased. They're going to actually consider all the facts. There'll be more writing and less images. And when you look at it, it might look a little bit boring. It might just look like paragraphs and paragraphs of writing because you've not got any um, images or you've got less pictures to support it. You might just have one picture of the person they're talking about and there might be like five or six paragraphs just going on and on about the information. Now, opinion pieces or tabloid journalism, they're more emotive. They'll have uh, a lot of emotions in it. They'll be like, the poor lady that was robbed by uh, the merciless and cruel gang of uh, teens. So, you know, that's more emotive. You're feeling sorry for the lady and you feel like, how dare you rob her to those teens that did it. They'll have a bigger subject matter. So they might not just be about academics. They might not be about politics. It could be about um, what's happening in EastEnders or which star is getting married to which star or what's going on in Hollywood. Now, the opinions on these type of journalistic pieces can be quite mild and so-so, or they can be ex very extreme and say, this is fantastic, they're getting married, aren't they amazing, the couple to keep up with. You know, and these are the people that we should be looking up to. They'll be eye-catching because they'll have big, bold headlines. They'll have subheadings that are quite catchy to get your attention. They'll have pictures main images and then have a little bit more smaller images to go with it so um there'll be less writing but there'll be more images to support these ones so i'll be okay with uh, the journalistic texts how they can be different from each other yes yeah mm -hmm. brilliant so let's go on to fictional texts now can someone tell me what fictional texts are? Just an example of what is a fiction. Books, some story. Yeah, but what type of books, Lydia? What do you think? Um, stories. Um, yeah, books no, like um, Harry Potter, made up yeah, books. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So things that have been made up. So yeah, fiction is yeah. out of. So there's a difference. Fiction is something that's made up of your imagination and your memory, and it's not it's not real. And non-fiction is based on facts and real things. Like it might be Anne Frank's diary or, you know, that's a, a non-fiction book. So with fictional text, you can get poems, books, movie scripts, novels, and so on with these. So there's many things. And these are some of their key features. They'll often use quite nice, flowery, cute language. They'll be very imaginative. Uh, if you've ever read Harry Potter or ever read any of those teenage uh, werewolf and vampire style books, you know they make up a lot of the language, don't they, within that. So it's quite imaginative. They'll have imaginary characters that are in imaginary situations, and it'll normally be out of this world where it's something that you know realistically it's not possible. 
They might have an unusual style. So like within poetry, they might have different style of line spacing. They might do a different type of paragraphing. They might split their work up into chapters and episodes or acts, especially for texts that are quite long or books. So just imagine opening a book and from start to finish, you're just reading all the way through. It's going to be boring. You don't know when to put down. But because they have chapters, they split things up. And, you know, I'll read one chapter today and I'll put it down and read the next one in an hour. And they're not going to quote any sources and they won't have any research in them on a normal basis because things will be made up. Now, the opposite of this is if you're reading, say, a historical romance novel, then you will have a little bit of research being done because they'll want to have known what it was like in the 1900s, what type of clothes people wore. So you'll have a slight um, research because it's based in an older reality. But besides that, on a normal basis for fully fictional books that have just been created out of pure imagination, they won't have any sources of research. So I'm going to read this to you and I'd like you to tell me what you think it is. So a few questions, four questions I'm going to ask you today. So in 2015, I'm going to ask you what example of writing is this? What is this writing style? Move my tool out of the way. So in 2015, it resulted in about 114,800 deaths. The condition was first described in the medical literature by the American physician James B. Herrick in 1910. In 1949, the genetic transmission was determined by E.A.B. and J.V. Neal. So is this a journalistic piece of writing, instructional, fictional or academic? What do you think this is? Academic. Academic. So let's see. D. 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 Let me lock that in. And you are correct because it is academic. My uh, screen is playing up. Let's go back. Yep, academic. Well done, everyone. Now, second question. What is this writing cell? The wind blew gently through her hair as she stood on the desolate riverbank. Journalistic, instructional, mm -hmm. fictional. C, well C. done. Very well done. It is C, it's fictional. Number three. The property aforementioned will remain the property of the leaseholder ad infinitum unless there is a change in property law. Journalistic, instructional, fictional, or official? Official. Official. And yes, it's official. Well done. And then the last one. After attaching the twine to the half-form mannequin, glue the lower side of the torso to it. Journalistic, instructional, fictional or official? Mm -hmm. well done. Yes, instructional because it's telling you what to do. Very well done. So another little bit of an activity now. So we're going to look at tone. So we know tone is about how you say something. So it doesn't really matter what you're physically saying. You could be, it's how you're saying it. So if I come to you, Lydia, and I say, is that right? And I could be like, is that right? You know, it really depends. First one is me just being a little bit like, oh, okay, is that right? I understand. Second one is me being a little bit more angry. So I said the same thing, but it depends on what tone you're using. So we're going to look at these and we're going to see which ones are the opposite of each other. So we've got sarcastic and polite, optimistic, fun, pessimistic, serious, erratic, consistent and genius. Now I'm going to get my colour tools out and I'd like you to tell me which ones are... So find ones in here and tell me what is opposite of each other. So I'm going to start off with one to help you out. So let's see. If I had, 
Pessimistic is when you're seeing the worst of something. So I'll explain that one first, just in case. So you're like, oh, the whole world's going to break down, or I'm going to get ill. You coughed on me. You know, it's you thinking the worst of everything. And erratic means um, that there's no regular pattern. It's unpredictable. So fictional writing can be like this sometimes. So that was just to tell you what these two mean. So if I go for sarcastic, what would be the opposite of sarcastic? You're being a bit like, oh, yeah, whatever. So you've got polite. You've got optimistic, fun. Pessimistic, serious, erratic, consistent, and genius. So I'm going to answer the first one for you. Polite. Like, oh, well done. I was, yeah, polite and sarcastic are opposite of each other. Now, what about optimistic? Optimistic is like, oh, yeah, everything's perfect. Pessimistic. Well done. Let me find the color that I can actually see. There you go. Optimistic and pessimistic. Well done. What about fun? What is that the opposite of? Yeah. Well done. And what about erratic? What is that the opposite of? Mm, erratic is no order. Consistent. Well done. And you'll see there's one on its own, so we're just going to keep that it on its own. It's genius, so we'll keep that there. But well done. Really good. So we've got a few examples here, and we're going to read them, and we'll tell you why they are these. So this is optimistic sentence here at the top. Just get that dotted there. So by the end of the concert, the crowd were ecstatic. I left feeling that I'd fallen in love with the music all over again. So it's optimistic because it's got positive language. They're ecstatic, it's upbeat, it's making me feel all happy and everything. And like, I can understand how this person was feeling. The second one is pessimistic, managerless, managerless, rudderless, hopeless. This football team haven't got a hope of avoiding relegation. So it's got the rule of three over here. Because that's there to make it exaggerated. It's got negative Language haven't got a hope on here. And then it, there's not anything saying, oh, they haven't got a hope, but you never know. Maybe they'll uh, have good luck or there'll be good conditions on the day. It's just all negative. It's like all the worst is going to happen. This football team, they're not going to win because they have bad management. They, are, they don't have any backbone. They're hopeless. They're going to lose. And that's it. So you've got one that makes you feel all happy and nice. And like, oh, yeah, anything's possible. And another's like, oh, yeah, it's all going bad because that's just the way it is. So that's a good example of um, optimistic and pessimistic here. Yeah. Then we've got polite and rude. So we've got the first one here. So if everybody washed their dishes, we wouldn't have the stinking mess. So it's rude. It's extremely rude. It is saying stinking. Thinking, honey, if they're washed there and they're being quite uh, vocal on that section, it's underlined because they've underlined it to focus that no one is doing their jobs. You know, it's got capitalized to make it stand out and it's quite a strong adjective. So it really makes you feel that this person is being rude. They could have said this in a, in a nicer way, but they decided not to. And then you've got a polite sentence. If all members could kindly leave via the back door, we would be very grateful. So it's, it's a, a nice request. It's lovely mannered. It's got nice vocabulary, like kindly, grateful. And it's quite indirect. It's not saying if you leave behind with the back door, then it'll be great. You know, they're just focusing on everybody in general. So it feels more polite. If someone's asking you to leave in this way, you're not going to be too bothered about it because it'll be nice. It's quite nice in the way to be asked. So I've got a little bit of background noise, if you don't mind muting. Um, thank you. Then we're almost at the end, by the way. Only a few more left. So then we've got genuine or sarcastic. So let's look at these. The first one is a sarcastic sentence. 
So it says, well done to all those bridge builders who wanted peace in the country. We know an even worse situation. Fantastic. So, you know, they're saying well done and they're saying fantastic, but they don't really mean it. They're being sarcastic, they're like, oh, she did a really bad job. You shouldn't have done that. They've got speech marks over here. Like they're saying, oh, these people were the bridge builders. They wanted to create a nice, harmonious situation, but they've made it worse. And then you've got a genuine sentence. So one day, all children in this nation will have the opportunity to attain an excellent education. So it inspires you. It makes you feel like, yeah, you know, hopefully one day this will happen, that all of our children will be able to get a good education, a good quality of life. It's positive. It's very idealistic. And it makes you feel a lot nicer. You're like, oh, yeah, there's good things in the world. We can do this. And then you've got serious and fun. So the top one is fun. She's been in the Big Brother house for two weeks. She'll paint the town red when she gets out. So it's it's fun. It's trivial. It's about something that really not many people care about. You might think, oh, okay, cool. She's in the Big Brother house. That's all right. It's cliched where they say she'll paint the town red. Let's put a T there. So she'll paint the town red. It means that so when you say someone's going to paint the town red, it's an old thing. It's where somebody's going to come out. They're going to have so much fun and excitement, and it's going to be very lively, big time for her. And then a serious sentence is by extracting the DNA using hitherto unused techniques. The scientists can speed up their current process. So it's a long sentence. It's formal. It's got subordinate clauses. And it's quite technical. And again, it's got archaic language as well. We don't normally say hitherto, do we? You know, we say, yeah, we're going to use new techniques that we haven't used before. But this makes it a bit more archaic. It's a bit more um, formal. Then you've got erratic or consistent. Let's scroll down so you can see the screen properly. So this is a, a text and it's quite, you've got to see, is it erratic? Is it consistent? What do you think? So all my life, I have been a supporter of the independent Democrats. You should be too. I first came across the policies in 1986 when I read the excellent manifesto for the local elections of that year. The opposition leader was an idiot. So it's a no-brainer. So it's quite fun. It's personal style. And then it goes a little bit more formal. And then it finishes off quite rudely. Because they're calling the person on the other team an idiot. And it's not nice. Then they carry on saying, the first election was brill. They secured an unprecedented 11% of the vote. And won councils in Surrey, Glamorganshire and Teesside. Couldn't win a single seat, said some my eye. So it's got shortened words on here. So brill for brilliant. So they shortened it up there. They've got a bit of sarcasm. My eye couldn't win a single seat. So they're making fun of what people said. And they've got some factual information, statistics by 11% of the vote and so on. And then it's a shame they folded in 1991 without trace. So short ending, they've not summarized it, they've not put a conclusion down. So what do you think? Is this erratic or is this consistent? Erratic. Yeah. Erratic. Why do you think it's erratic? You're correct. It is erratic, hundred percent. But why do you, why what's made you come to that conclusion? <laughs> is it because the information is everywhere and they're just so mixed up aren't they there's not like there's not like any structure to it they're using lots of different styles of writing it's all over the place it's telling you about how they've been supportive of the of a particular political team they're telling demanding that you should be it 
the saying that when they came is excellent, they're making fun of other people, they're being rude, then they're being sarcastic, and then they're doing quotations and statistics, and then they're just closing it off without anything. So yeah, you're, you're right, it is erotic because there's no rhyme or reason, there's no order to it at all. And then this last section for here, we're just going to talk about the writer's voice. Now, when we say the term writer's voice, we actually mean what sort of tone, what sort of style. So the writer's voice is an individual, it's their style of writing, it's the style of the writing that the author does. So it's what it's their unique and personal way of writing. So what we look at is how somebody uses style, how they use tone and attitude. Now, my style of writing and all of your styles of writing, they're not going to be seen the same. And that's not saying that Lydia's is better or that uh, Clifford's is better or mine is better. No, it's not. Everybody's <laughs> will be good. It's just that everybody has a different style of writing. It's the way we convey ourselves. It's, the, it's how, if we were all to write a novel or a piece of text, it's how we would put our information down. So this writer's voice is, is like the attitude that is illustrated by what the writer's beliefs and values are, you know, what it conveys the emotional part of their writing. And it's a combination of really everything that you would have in writing. And it shows what that type of person is, because when you do do writing, you've got opinions, you've got bias, and you will have a certain style or a certain way that you believe in things and that will come through into your writing so that's what we mean when we say writer's voice is that understandable or would you like me to explain that a little bit more clearly yeah, yeah. yeah. so my laptop is lagging a little bit today let me just put that back on there take this off so today, hopefully, you've been able to identify different writing styles and you'll be able to identify the seriousness and the formality in journalistic styles. You'll know what tones there are, sarcasm, fun, optimistic, pessimistic, erratic, consistent, polite and rude and so on with the opposite tones. And you should hopefully understand what the writer's voice is. Now, I've got a piece of homework that I'd like you to have emailed to you this morning and it's just got a few um questions on here that will get you prepared for your exam so it's writing styles tone and it's just got some questions like identify the style you would expect for an article a recipe a will a will for when someone's writing down their last uh, testament if they die who's going to get their properties and money and so on then identify the tone in these extracts. So you've got two sections here. So if we go on to the first section and we'll work on, say, the first two together. So if you've got an article about a new cancer treatment, what do you think would the style be? Would it instructional, factual, official, academic, journalistic? Journalistic. It is in a way because it's an article, isn't it? But don't get confused. When you see article, it's not always in a newspaper. Article just means a, a, a bit of writing. So it could be in a book or just like a, 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 a couple of paragraphs, a little section of writing. So I wouldn't go with journalistic. I would go with the factual or oh, academic here. Yeah. Because it's giving you information, isn't it? Now, I don't want... Oh, so have I just deleted that part? That's strange. There you go. Now it works. So I would just write down factual or academic, and that will be... But if you just decide it's factual, that's up to you. That's fine. Now, with the second one, a recipe, what would this be? They're giving you a recipe. They're telling you how to make a cake. What is your style? Yeah. So I'm not looking for full sentences here. Just tell me what it is, and that's fine. So you got a few more here. 
Now, if we go on to identifying the tone, and now these I'm just looking for. So the tones are things like fun or sarcastic or rude or optimistic or genuine or serious. So you'll be dancing in the aisles when you see Bake Off the musical. But what does this feel like? Because they're saying dancing in the aisles, so it's not serious, obviously, because they're having all this uh, fun language over here. So, what do you think this would be? Uh, I, I would say fun, yeah. Um, um. Because it is fun, isn't it? Because, you know, if you've got a serious document, they're not going to be telling you that you're going to be dancing all through, uh, um, for example, if you're in Tesco's or anything. And then this second one, just to give you a bit of a, a point of how it goes. So remember, just use one word. I don't want sentences, just the one word answer is fine. So, so-called researchers claim they have made a significant breakthrough in their studies. So here, they're calling someone so-called. So they're not being very nice. They're using the, remember when I showed you an example where they use speech marks to do a particular thing? Sarcastic. Yes, well done. So it's sarcastic. So yeah, we're just looking in that type of point there now. So, so go through this. Just tell me exactly what they are. I don't want big and normal sentences. Just give me the one word answers and then I'll get them marked and so on. So brilliant. Let's stop recording.